Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this virtual meeting of the Scottish Parliament. The first item of business is portfolio questions, which will be in the first ones, transport, infrastructure and connectivity. Can I ask those members who wish to do a ask a supplementary, who are in the chat function, but only during that question, please, not in advance. Can I call on firstly Tom Mason, please? Mr Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to the future of use of hydrogen powered trains on the Edinburgh Dundee Aberdeen. Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary, please. Action plan, action plan envisages an electrified railway between Edinburgh and Aberdeen. However, the optimum programme to achieve this remains under analysis and a range of traction options. Electric, battery and hydrogen fuel cell are under consideration to expedite the replacement of our diesel trains. Through our Hydrogen Exhilarator Initiative at St Andrews University, we are building capability and its zero emission train project at Bones, managed by world leading hydrogen technology company Arcola Energy, seeks to address the issues associated with creating and then enabling a hydrogen fuel cell train to operate on the network later this year. Thank you. Tom Mason, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that, that, that response. First hydrogen trains are due to be displayed at COP26 later this year, demonstrating the future of sustainable rail travel. My concern is that the main line in Aberdeen is only due to be electrified by 2035. In, in addition, electrified gantries are visually unattractive, expensive, and in any event, half the energy is lost in transmission. It is possible hydrogen change could be introduced on the line at a reduced cost to electrification and very much sooner. Finally, we could face a situation where electrification is finished only for the line to face more long term disruption to introduce hydrogen technology. So, can the Cabinet Secretary set out whether these improvements could be undertaken concurrently? Or should my constituents look at hydrogen trains as something they might see in 25 years or more? Uh, before you answer, Cabinet Secretary, I thought by now I didn't need to say short supplementaries, please, and if we can, simply sim similar answers. Mr. Mason, you're a naughty person. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding officer, we are looking at a range of different traction options. However, my only note of caution in terms of the use of hydrogen fuel cell trains is that their ability to operate on long distance networks at high speed is significantly reduced um, and the technology is still developing in this sector. Uh, Scotland is one of the leading uh, countries in taking forward hydrogen in the use of in, in rail services, which is why we have the present project being taken forward at Bones. But the member can be assured that it is one of the areas that we are looking at, and if it is viewed as being the most appropriate traction type for improving services in the future uh, to Aberdeen, then it will be the approach will be taken. But that analysis is still being taken forward, and electrification and battery electric trains are also being considered at this time. Thank you. Question two has not been lost. Question three, Richard Lyle, please. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it has taken to ensure that the major road routes are kept open during bad weather. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, whilst we know severe weather will cause disruption, uh, this Government has taken a wide range of steps to improve our resilience to the challenges of winter to mitigate its impacts and to recover our transport networks, businesses and get daily life back to normal as quickly as possible. This has been done in partnership with public, private and third sector partners and has included new investment, development and innovation, all learning the lessons from recent winters. Plans are in place to cover the three concurrent risks for this winter, COVID-19, EU exit and winter preparedness. Richard Lyle, please. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply? During the last week, Scotland has faced severe snowfalls in certain parts of the country. And I, I thank all staff who have worked to keep the country moving. Can I ask what part has local councils played in ensuring that there is minimal disruption to the roads network? 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, uh, while Scotland's uh, 32 uh, local authorities are responsible for all winter service operations within their own jurisdiction, uh, road, road authorities do very often work in partnership. Uh, following the uh, early forecasts of severe weather we experienced in recent weeks, uh, winter partners at Scots, Presla and Solace, along with Transport Scotland, have been holding extraordinary winter maintenance meetings to discuss preparations uh, and to offer mutual aid where appropriate. They have also included looking at uh, salt supplies and also maintaining public access to our vaccination centres. I think it does go to show uh, the vital uh, role that our local councils play in making sure that we minimise disruptions to our roads during periods of adverse weather. And I want to echo uh, the thanks that has been offered by Richard Lyle to all of the roads crews who have worked extremely hard in what have been very severe conditions over a prolonged period of time. Question four, Emma Harper. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the funding progress and priorities for the Borderlands Growth Deal. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government's significant investment in the Borderlands deal, up to £85 million over 10 years, will support a range of projects that will drive economic growth across the area. The projects supported will focus on themes like improving the quality of place, boosting tourism, delivering business infrastructure, driving innovation, improving connectivity and creating the skills needed by industry. We hope to sign the full deal in the next few weeks and are working with local authority partners and the UK government towards that milestone. Emma Harper, please. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. There have been concerns released, uh, raised by local authority members in the north of England that the £65 million of funding from the UK government is not new money and that it is being moved from other government portfolios. We know that ScotGov have committed £20 million more than the UK government for Borderlands. But can I seek assurances from the Cabinet Secretary that all the money pledged for Borderlands, including for Stranraer Waterfront, from the Scott Government is new money, and can he comment on whether the UK Government is truly committed to the project? Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely, officer. We are fully committed to the Borderlands deal with the pledge of £85 million in support of the deal overall. All of that funding is additional spend in the region from my portfolio, and it's not been taken from any other portfolio area. Um, I do. I am aware uh, of some of these concerns, uh, although I would note that the press release that was issued by the UK government back in 2019 in announcing the uh, support for the deal confirmed that there are £65 million uh, that have been allocated. Uh, for the Scottish element of the deal, it was new money, and I would fully expect that to remain their uh, commitment and to be honoured. The specific uh, projects uh, to be supported in the Borderlands deal, uh, funding uh, from the Scottish aspect, uh, cover a range of the areas I mentioned in my earlier response, uh, and I do hope to be in a position where we can sign heads of, we can move on from signing heads of terms to the final deal in the weeks ahead. The £16 million pounds that we have earmarked for supporting the redevelopment of Stranra Marina uh, is uh, within the overall proposal at the present moment, and I hope that the local authority will develop the full business case in this matter to ensure that it can be included within the final deal and the £16 million, pounds which has been invested by the Scottish Government to deliver on the project of the redevelopment. A uh, supplementary from Colin Smith, please. Thank you, saying enough, sir. Having been involved at the first Borderlands Initiative Summit uh, almost eight years ago, I welcome the fact we'll soon see the signing of the growth deal in the next few weeks. But given the importance of the projects brought together, thanks to the hard work of councils in South Scotland and the North of England, will the Cabinet Secretary give consideration to, to bringing forward funding early if any of them can be accelerated further? And will we also actively encourage new projects to be added to this deal, or indeed a Borderlands too, because we really do need to step up of investment if we are to kickstart the South Scotland economy post-pandemic. Cabinet Secretary. Well, 
Presenting officer, I do know that the Borderlands partners are working hard to finalise the business cases that they need to bring together for the final signing of uh, the full deal. And I do recognise the need to make sure that we invest in the Borderlands area in order to deliver the type of economic, inclusive economic growth that we are all looking for, and I know that Colin Smith will be looking for as well. That's why the Scottish Government has committed to investing an additional £20 million into the overall fund, above that of what's being provided by the UK Government, to help to take forward a range of projects that will make a real difference to the local community, whether it be about building capacity for uh, the economy or improving tourism or transport infrastructure, all of which will play an important part in the success of the deal. In terms of bringing forward funding, part of that will be dependent upon the work that is taken forward by local authorities in developing the business case for each of the areas that they intend to take forward, and we are working hard with them to make sure that that is progressed. Question 5, Tom Arthur. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting rail services in the Renfrewshire South constituency. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has provided unprecedented financial support to maintain essential rail services throughout this pandemic period. To a strong and green future, there we are investing in rail, infra- uh, rail electrification on the route between Glasgow and Barhead. Uh, subsequently accommodating quieter, more environmentally friendly electric trains whilst increasing capacity of services and improving resilience on the network. Accessibility work at Johnston stations are also uh, due to commence later this year. Electrification of the route uh, between Busby Junction and Barhead is being developed. Network Rail's initial Estimated cost is that it will cost between £25 and £35 million. Pounds. However, we continue to engage with Network Rail in order to find efficiencies in this programme. Come on, sir. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that um, answer and also express my gratitude to those working on our railways in Renfrewshire South and across Scotland. And in answer to the earlier question, the Cabinet Secretary touched on some of the multifaceted aspects. Scotland will benefit from decarbonisation of our railways. I wondered if you could expand on that, and in particular in the project to electrify the line from Barhead to Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, a number of significant benefits are gained from electrification of a rail network. They provide quieter trains, uh, and they are faster uh, trains in terms of traction type. Um, but alongside that, it allows us to increase capacity on important lines from um, the members' uh, constituency into the central belt and also uh, beyond that uh, as well. And that's why electrification can play an important part in improving our overall delivery of rail services. Alongside that, it will help to support us in decarbonising our rail network uh, because electric trains are more environmentally friendly. So there's a combination of significant benefits that. Uh, the members' constituents will benefit from this by increased capacity, faster trains, quieter trains, and also that they are able to actually deliver a better services for a better service for passengers overall. Question six, David Torrens, please. The Torrens. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assistance it gives to the development of new railway infrastructure. Cabinet Secretary. We have invested heavily in rail infrastructure and services, spending over £8 billion since 2007. Going forward, there is significant investment of some £4.85 billion over the five year period from 2019 to 2024. Part of our investment, this Scottish Government is committed to ensuring the railways meet future growth needs for passengers and for freight. And an example of this is our commitment to deliver the new railway at Leavenmouth, providing new fully accessible stations in Leaven and at Cameron Bridge. Mr. Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. In Leavenmouth, a leadership group of local community councils, Leavenmouth Rail Campaign representatives, 
residence has been established will play a key role in deciding how the £10 million pledge by the Scottish Government and Fine Council for Leibmar's blueprint is spent. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that groups like these are a part of a wider programme of consultation with communities are vital to ensure that local community funding brings the maximum benefits to local people? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, officer, I do agree um, uh, with my colleague on this matter. Uh, we uh, set out at the time when we announced that we were reconnecting Leaving Mouth to uh, the rail network, uh, that we would provide £5 million uh, to help to support associated works to make sure we maximise the economic benefits that can be gained from reconnecting the area to the rail network. Uh, Fife Council uh, have matched that, providing £10 million um, as part of the fund that can help to support wider benefits that will be associated with reconnecting leaving to the rail network. What I can say to the member is that the work that has been taken forward through the Leave Mouth Reconnecting work is a, a task force that has been led by Fife Council. It has a range of different local stakeholders on it, and they will all have an important part to play to make sure that once the line has been reconnected, that we maximise the local and regional benefits that will come from this significant investment in the area and improving its transport connectivity. Question 7, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government for an update on its latest ferries plan. Minister Paul Gilhouse. Thank you, President Officer. The Islands Connectivity Plan will replace the ferries plan by the end of 2022. It will be developed within the context of the recently published National Transport Strategy and our National Islands Plan, both of which align with the Scottish Government's purpose and national outcomes. It will also link to the Emerging Strategic Transport Project Review, and the plan will have regard to aviation, ferries and fixed links, as well as connecting and onward travel. The new plan will include a long-term programme of investments in vessels and ports, developed with the support of £580 million of ferries investment over the next five years alone, which was announced within the Scottish Government's Infrastructure and Investment Plan. Alistair Allen. I thank the Minister for his reply. Can he indicate whether the Scottish Government will be giving any more consideration to the idea that some existing ferry routes might in future more cost effectively be replaced by fixed links such as causeways, bridges or tunnels? Can, uh, sorry, uh, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Yes, certainly in answer to the Member's question, consideration will be given to uh, replacing ferry routes with other forms of connectivity and connections such as fixed links to the and this will be taken forward through the work uh, undertaken as part of the strategic transport project review and as indicated in my initial answer that will then feed into the islands connectivity plan which we would seek to implement uh, by the end of 2022 uh, obviously keen to, to engage with the member if you have specific proposals but that is the structure and the process which we will undertake thank you two brief supplementaries first from graham simpson then liam MacArthur. mr simpson Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I wonder if the Minister can tell us how many new ferries he thinks uh, are needed in Scotland in the next five years and in the next ten years. Minister. It's obviously a very important question, and it kind of follows through from the, the inquiry work of the Committee, uh, Presiding Officer. And we certainly are an, already undertaking an analysis looking at the future pipeline of ferries uh, in that kind of timescale in terms of immediate projects such as the work that's already underway with the Isla Vessel, uh, discussions with uh, communities affected by the Gurik Danoon route, and indeed Kilcregan, thinking about the replacement vessels there. We have a small vessel replacement programme under development with a further eight vessels, which are likely to be developed as a programme uh, looking particularly to decarbonise those vessels uh, through uh, alternative propulsion systems. So I can provide further detail, because I don't know if so, rather than take a long answer here. Uh, to Mr Simpson about what work is already underway, but that would certainly be a core part of the Islands Connectivity Plan and the Vessel Replacement Deployment Plan. And Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Deputy President. Obviously, can I thank the Minister for that uh, encouraging update. Uh, he will be aware of the pressing and urgent need for the replacement of the ageing internal ferry fleet in Orkney. Uh, can he confirm that that will be laid out uh, in, these, uh, in this plan? And does he share the view of uh, some of his colleagues suggesting that the lack of progress um, so far on this issue is due to, quote, a lack of vision uh, from the current and previous uh, leadership of Orkney Islands Council? Minister. I, I would want to, to comment on the, the leadership of the Council. Um, obviously, have a good 
relationship with Councillor Stockin and his team. We've been working very closely with Transport Scotland to uh, outline their, their needs, their investment needs. I had a very productive discussion recently with the Finance Secretary, uh, Kate Forbes, and myself and the leaders of uh, Orkney and Shetland Councils around funding for internal ferry services. And I want to reassure Mr MacArthur that very much we are aware of the, the, the needs for investment in those, uh, in those areas, particularly in Orkney, where there is a substantial backlog of investment, as he may recall. Uh, but these are matters that we are, we are taking forward actively, so I do not want to prejudge the outcome of those discussions, other than to say they have been very constructive so far. And question eight, Neil Finlay. To ask the Scottish Government when it plans to take Scotland Railways back into public ownership. Cabinet Secretary. Thing officer, our view remains that an integrated publicly se public sector controlled railway fully accountable to Scottish ministers and Parliament will best serve Scotland. Repeated calls on UK ministers to give Scotland the powers needed to secure the best future for Scotland Railway and to remove the absurdities and the anomalies of the current system have so far been denied. While we await the findings of the delayed UK Rail Review, we are considering all options available for us uh, for the future operation of Scott Rail services after the current contract, which, expect, which is expected to end in March 2022. Mr Finlay. The Abelio franchise has been an expensive disaster. Um, the Labour government in Wales has taken the railways Wales back into public ownership to protect essential services. Why hasn't the Scottish government done that here? Cabinet Secretary. Epsing officer, my understanding of what has happened in Wales is that they have moved to operator of last resort due to financial difficulties with the franchise agreement which they had in place with their rail provider. I am also aware that they have some private sector involvement in their rail infrastructure, which is not something which I am in favour of, because I prefer the rail infrastructure to remain within public sector control. The critical element here is what is the best way in which to deliver better passenger services. In my view, that is through a public sector controlled railway, not just in terms of the simple rolling stock element of it, but also the infrastructure element of it and how we can better integrate both elements of that. And that's the area that we are giving significant consideration to at the present moment for the future design of a publicly controlled rail network in Scotland, not just on the actual infrastructure, but also in the rolling stock element of it as well. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I'm moving on to the next set of portfolio questions, which is in justice and law officers. Can I again ask for short questions and succinct answers? And if you want a supplementary, put R in the chat function when that question is being asked, please, and not before. Hope that's clear. Question number one, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in resuming jury trials in Mid Scotland and Fife. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. This is, of course, an operational matter for the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. Uh, but I understand that within the sheriffdom of Tayside Central and Fife, which covers the area in question, uh, jury trials have resumed in the courts at Dundee, Perth, Falkirk, and Kirkcaldy. Uh, solemn business from other courts in the sheriffdom, namely Alloa, Forfar, Dunfermline, and Stirling, is still is being transferred to these four courts. And SCTS anticipates that normal sheriff and jury trial capacity will be resumed across Scotland by the end of this month. Clear Baker. Um, thank you. The importance of resuming trials is made clear by Victim Support Scotland, who report a significant rise in the amount of people seeking support. Um, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, I was going to ask about the business in Dunfermline, but I understand that comes under the business that has been restarted. So, Can I ask him, with a predicted backlog of some 2,000 cases expected by in March, what, uh, the, and also the majority of summary trials are currently on hold, what further steps could be taken by the Scottish Government to ensure the backlog is reduced and that timescales can be shortened? Cabinet Secretary. Well, this is a hugely important question by uh, Claire Baker. The impact of the suspension of trials in the first wave of uh, the, 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 the pandemic, and now, of course, with the most recent announcement made by the Lord President, uh, is significant. So, uh, Claire Baker may know from the uh, Scottish Budget Statement at the end of January, that the government has committed 
50 million towards the Recover, Renew and Transform project, which will go directly into ensuring that we make a dent into the backlog. So I can give uh, Claire Buick an absolute assurance the Criminal Justice Board is looking at how to best spend that 50 million so that we can reduce the impact of that increasing backlog. Question two, Mary Fee. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how many virtual prison visits have taken place since the 29th of June 2020. Cabinet Secretary. Well, we all recognise the value and importance of family contact, the impact that the necessary restrictions in prisons have had on those in custody and their family. It has been challenging for all of those involved. That throughout this pandemic, the SPS and Scottish Government have been working on ways in which we can support those in custody and their families to maintain uh, contact and virtual visits are a key part of that. Uh, to answer Mary Fee's question directly, uh, by the 7th of February uh, of this year, over 29,500 virtual prison visits had taken place. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? With restrictions on travel and prison visits, digital visits will have been a lifeline for many supporting both the welfare and mental health of prisoners. In light of the fact that there are over 1,200 prisoners currently self-isolating, what support is given what, what support is given to support prison activities, including digital visits? And can the Cabinet Secretary assure me that digital prison visits will continue after the pandemic? And if so, will they be as available as they are currently, or will they be scaled back? Cabinet Secretary. There's a few questions in there, presenting officer, which I will uh, attempt to answer. Can I first of all put on record uh, Mary Fee's long-standing interest uh, and championing of the rights uh, of the families outside, who often have a family member, unfortunately, uh, incarcerated in our squatted, in our prisons. Um, can I say that virtual visits have been a lifeline, as Mary Fee rightly describes them, for many people in our care? Uh, to answer her last question directly, we would absolutely. Uh, is our desire in the Scottish Government to ensure that virtual visits can continue after the pandemic because of the successful uh, rollout of virtual visits and the impacts and effects that they've had. In terms of the current situation, where a number of prisoners are self-isolating across, predominantly across uh, three sites, HMP Kilmarnock, Adiwell uh, and HMP Dumfries, uh, some uh, virtual visits have had to be suspended on public health grounds, but to give an assurance to Mary Fee, mobile phones and in-cell telephony are still available to enable family contact. And SBS are currently looking at what more can be done uh, to ensure that there is family contact between those in prison and their families outside. Question 3, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting court services during the COVID-19 pandemic. Cabinet Secretary. Well, we've been supporting SCTS uh, in a number of different ways during the pandemic, from progressing emergency legislation to allow business to operate virtually and remotely. Uh, we've provided £15 million pounds to strengthen court technology and established the UK's first ever remote jury centres, enabling the safe resumption of trials. Uh, last week, I met with the Criminal Justice Board to discuss a range of our next steps. And next month, I'll hold a roundtable event with members of the Justice Committee uh, and indeed other stakeholders to discuss options to address the current caseload, including, uh, as I've already said to Claire Baker, how we can maximise the opportunities presented by the additional fifty million announced in the budget statement. Finley Carson. Yeah, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. Given that the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service has announced further restrictions in court activity until the end of March, which is yet another devastating blow to victims who will now have to wait longer in their quest for justice, why hasn't the SNP government given courts such as Dumfries and my constituency the appropriate resources to become COVID safe for business and allow more victims to gain justice? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first and foremost, we recognise the impact that any suspension of courts can have on victims. It should be said, of course, that is not a decision for the Scottish Government to take. It is one rightly taken independently by the Lord President. And we have uh, increased uh, funding for victims' organisations. But what I would say to Finlay Carson, I know he has a long-standing interest uh, in the court in Dumfries, and of course, uh, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service has have confirmed that when it comes to the plans of potentially increasing court capacity and using that 50 million, that of course Dumfries will be part of that consideration. A brief supplementary word of grant, please. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask whether any research has been undertaken around victims and complainants becoming disillusioned with the justice system due to late uh, postponements? Has the Scottish Government looked at whether they are either refusing to interact with the justice system or looking at for recourse in other ways? That would be a real issue for the justice system and could undermine public confidence. Cabinet Secretary. So I meet with victim support organisations on a very regular basis, and they do express some challenges and difficulties that, of course, any delay in trials coming to court uh, can have on victims. I should say that when it comes to the remote jury centre uh, model, and I'm happy to write to Rhoda Grant in more detail on this, uh, we in the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service are looking at how we evaluate that model to see the impact that it can have on all of those involved, victims included, but the accused and indeed witnesses uh, as well. But Rhoda Grant raises an important point. And if I can give her an absolute assurance, uh, I will continue my engagement with victim support organisations on these matters. Question four, Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is working with Police Scotland to engage with young people who are at risk of offending during the pandemic. Minister Ash Denham, please. We work closely with Police Scotland to deliver the successful whole system approach to preventing offending by young people. Police Scotland have confirmed their commitment to incorporation of the UNCRC into Scots law and to keeping the care review promise, and they are contributing to the development of a refreshed national youth justice action plan and will ensure that their own approach reflects those commitments. Police Scotland's engagement with young people is obviously an operational matter for the Chief Constable, but Police Scotland have been clear. Throughout the current pandemic, they will continue to operate under the principle of policing by consent and will follow the four E's approach. So that's engage, explain, encourage, and then only enforce to protect public health. And I appreciate the hard work of the police throughout this pandemic and the professionalism that they have shown. Maureen Watt. Can I thank the Minister for that answer and associate myself with her thanks uh, to the police? Tory in my constituency has recently seen an upsurge in small-scale youth vandalism. Prior to COVID and its restrictions, Police Scotland, along with partners such as Street Sports Scotland, were able to nip these issues in the bud with diversionary activities. Can the Minister say what actions are available at the moment to deal with such unnecessary vandalism? Minister. So I appreciate that the current restrictions are putting a strain on the delivery of face-to-face -face diversionary activities provided by local partners. And we can appreciate that boredom and a lack of activities is one of the biggest issues that is affecting young people at the moment. So a variety of creative initiatives have been developed by local authorities and also key partners for keeping in touch with young people and ensuring that they have access to activities. And I'm grateful to those who continue to provide such support during this very difficult time. Question six, uh, beg your pardon. Question five, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government how additional funding announced in its draft budget will be used to keep communities safe. Cabinet Secretary. The 2021-22 Justice Portfolio Budget will be over £3 billion. This includes a £60 million increase for the Scottish Police Authority, which will eliminate the police budget deficit. That will allow Police Scotland to deliver a sustainable budget position while protecting the police workforce. We continue to be grateful to both police officers and staff who put themselves in harm's way to protect the public and keep communities safe, particularly during the current COVID-19 pandemic. James Dornan. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I note that David Crichton, the interim chair of the Scottish Police Authority, said that the budget represented a strong vote of confidence in the authority and Police Scotland, and particularly recognises the outstanding performance of the police service in perfect, protecting country's safety and well-being during the pandemic. But could the Cabinet Secretary tell me what further actions is the Scottish Government taking to keep crime at its second lowest level since 1974? Secretary. Well, well, David Crichton was absolutely right in characterising that as a huge vote in confidence uh, in the work that Police Scotland are doing. They have done an incredible job, both our staff and indeed our police officers, in keeping us safe during the pandemic. And we will continue to invest in the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit, which has been recognised worldwide 
for the good work that they've done, the Navigators Programme, the Mentors and Violence Prevention, and No Lives, uh, No Knives, sorry, Better Lives uh, Programme. Additional funding will be used to expand these programmes, enable further support within our communities, within our schools, and indeed hospitals to prevent and tackle violence uh, and knife crime. We'll continue to support our national and local community safety partners to share resources, provide services to inform and reassure the public with trusted and consistent information, advice on how to keep themselves and their communities safe from crime. We provided annual grant funding to Neighbourhood Watch and Crime Stoppers since 2014 to help support the prevention and indeed the reporting of crime. And a supplement from Liam Kerr, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the draft budget, the SNP intends to cut the capital budget for victims and witnesses support by £2 million, whilst increasing the total budget for offender services by £2.3 million. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that prioritising offenders at the expense of victims is surely the wrong way round, and that victims will not feel safe or supported with this increasingly soft-touch approach to justice? Cabinet Secretary. I couldn't disagree more with the characterisation from Liam Kerr. Capital costs would have been for, of course, uh, one-off one, one projects. But what I would say is this binary approach of spending on offenders versus spending on victims is the wrong way to look at things. When we invest in offenders, it is hopefully with the intention of ensuring that they do not go on to reoffend. If they do not reoffend, there are, of course, less victims of crime, and everybody in society wins. So I would urge my colleague. Uh, Liam Kerr to instead of looking at things uh, at this issue through a paradigm of hard justice versus soft justice, he does what the Scottish Government does, which is follow the evidence which will lead them to a smart justice approach. Question six, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans there are to increase the number of divisional police officers in the North East. Cabinet Secretary. Well, let me start by continuing to reiterate my appreciation for the hard work of police throughout the pandemic, with all the professionalism they have shown, particularly uh, in the North East, but right across Scotland, uh, for keeping us safe during the pandemic. We currently have 17,234 police officers in Scotland, significantly above the level inherited in 2007. Uh, following the recent publication of Police Scotland's Strategic Workforce Plan, the Chief Constable has made it clear uh, that given the continued response to COVID-19 and with Glasgow hosting COP26 later this year, he does not believe police officer numbers should be reduced at this time. And I won't rehearse what I've just said about the budget, which of course eliminates Police Scotland's structural deficit. Also, although the operational deployment of police officers is of course a matter for the Chief Constable, <clears throat> I note that Police Scotland data shows that on a like-for-like -like basis, there are now 40 more police officers in the North East Police Division than they were in September 2013. Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, since 2013, Aberdeenshire has seen violent crime triple, whilst the five police stations have closed, uh, including <coughs> Kemney uh, in my constituency. Just a few days ago, Kemney and District Rifle Club had their buildings burned to the ground in a deliberate fire. There were fewer police officers and fewer police stations. Is the Justice Secretary going to do anything to protect rural communities? Secretary. Well, again, I disagree with his characterisation, with Alice Burnett's character, characterisation. I am sorry, of course, to hear of the incidents that he refers to. But of course, crime has fallen under this SNP uh, government. In fact, it is at one of its lowest levels in four decades. We continue to invest in the police at record levels. And we continue to ensure that the number of police officers is significantly above the level we inherited in 2007. In fact, in Scotland, there are 32 officers per 10,000 in the population in Scotland, compared to around 22 officers per 10,000 in the population in England and Wales. Scotland is a safer place under this SNP-led Scottish Government. All of the statistics will, of course, bear that out over the last decade. Uh, what I would say uh, to Alexander Burnett, if there are particular issues that he feels need addressed, then he should take those up, of course, operationally with the local divisional commander. Question 7, Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when the new HMP Inverness will be completed. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, a site has been purchased on the east side of Inverness. Early procurement activity is underway. The tendering process is due to commence later this spring, and we expect enabling construction work to start this autumn. Our new infrastructure investment plan for Scotland, published on the 4th of February, Sets out that the operational dates for HMP Highland is estimated 
for February 2024. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2011, the prison was due to cost £52 million. 2016, it had gone to 66. 2021, it's risen to £110 million. You promised the delivery of the prison before the last election, promised again in 2018. Sounds like you're promising it now. What promise will you give that can be believed that it will be completed by 2024? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I know Edward Mountain has done his best to cast doubt on the building of a new prison for Inverness, despite his uh, somewhat deliberate mischief, presenting officer, the naysayer has been proven wrong. Uh, once again, I'm delighted the Scottish Government has confirmed our intention to fund and build HNP Highland. Its inclusion in the Scottish Government Infrastructure Investment Plan is testament to our commitment. So I would plead with Mr Mountain to take a more constructive approach, as, for example, the MSP for Inverness and Nairn, Fergus Ewing, has done. He's engaged constructively with both the Scottish Government and the SPS, and in doing so has made the very persuasive case for HNP Highlands inclusion in the Infrastructure Investment Plan. I'm pleased to see that progress is being made in replacing H HNP Inverness, and of course that progress will not only be continued to be made, but will be funded by this SNP-led Scottish Government. A supplementary, Emma Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its assessment is of HMP Dumfries, Scotland's oldest functional prison site. Cabinet Secretary. Well, as a member may be aware, there is a current outbreak in HMP Dumfries. To give her some confidence, I am in regular contact with the interim chief executive, Theresa Medhurst, uh, in regular contact with Theresa Medhurst in relation to the outbreaks in HMP Dumfries, uh, HMP Kilmarnock, and Addy Well. Uh, we are keeping a close eye on what more needs to be done uh, in HMP Dumfries to ensure that that outbreak does not spread uh, any further. And I'm confident that we have the appropriate public health guidance uh, in place uh, to ensure that we can manage uh, that outbreak. But if Ms Harper would like any further detailed information uh, on the situation in HMP Dumfries, I can ensure that SPS make themselves available uh, to her. Question 8, to Beatrice Wishart. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports victims of crime in remote and rural communities. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we are providing 18.7 million in 2020-2021 20, uh, to support victims of crime. We are also investing, and have invested, I should say, 12 million to tackle violence against women and girls, and provided an additional 5.75 million uh, in year in recognition of the impact of the ongoing restrictions on those who are experiencing domestic abuse. And this includes funding for organisations who provide frontline practical, emotional uh, and indeed financial support to victims and survivors right across Scotland, including in remote and rural communities. Support can be accessed by telephone, live web chat, and when COVID restrictions, of course, allow, very much in person. Just wish it, please. Presiding officer, I declare an interest as I'm a board member of Shetland Women's Aid. Um, people in the islands are getting a poor deal on legal aid assistance. I'm told that legal aid doesn't cover the cost of travel to the islands. Domestic abuse survivors are forced to look to the mainland for legal aid solicitors because they can't access that service locally, and other constituents tell me they've given up important civil appeal opportunities because of these barriers to legal aid access. What will the Cabinet Secretary do to address this geographical inequality? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'll certainly confirm to the member that I, I will take a closer look at this very issue. She may be aware that the Minister for Community Safety has previously said that we do intend uh, elections pending, of course, uh, to introduce a legal aid bill. And of course, these important issues and many others uh, can be consulted upon in consideration for such a bill. But if there is something we can do in the more immediate term, then of course I'm happy to look at that. So if Beatrice Wishart will allow me to, uh, I'll take a look at that issue in closer detail. And, and make sure that uh, we respond back to her uh, in greater detail. And a supplementary from Rachel Hamilton, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, with rural areas often forgotten by the SNP and fewer police officers now in the borders, research shows that one in four people are not reporting a rural crime of which they were a victim. Therefore, can I ask what efforts the Scottish Government is taking to work with rural communities to ensure that crime is reported and to address the reason why the perception of police performance has declined? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I disagree with uh, the characterisation from Rachel Hamilton that somehow police performance has declined. Quite the opposite. We should be thanking our police officers for the incredible work 
uh, that they and staff have done throughout this pandemic to keep Scotland safe. Scotland has one of the lowest crime rec rates uh, in the last 40 years. Uh, and not only that, uh, we have seen significant reductions in violent crime over the last decade, uh, as well as in many other categories of crime, and that is replicated right across Scotland. What I would say to Rachel Hamilton is that, uh, of course, divisional numbers uh, and, and, and local numbers, subdivisional numbers of police officers are important. She must and should recognise that national resources can also make a huge uh, impact at a local level as well. So, for example, national uh, funding and resource put into major investigations can have an impact on local divisions as well. If she has particular issues on an operational basis that she wishes to raise with her local divisional commander, uh, she should do so. Thank you. That concludes questions on justice and law officers. I will move straight on to the final portfolio uh, questions, which is on Constitution, Europe and External Affairs. Can I remind members that questions five and seven have been grouped together, and that I will take any supplementaries to these questions when both of those questions have been answered. And I also remind members when you want a supplementary, put R in the chat function when that question is being answered and not before. That's just confusing. Question number one, Gail Ross, please. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact Brexit has had on workers coming to Scotland from the EU. Minister Jenny Gilruth, please. Given the extraordinary circumstances of the global pandemic, the full impact of Brexit on Scotland's workforce is currently unclear. Ultimately, however, fewer EU workers will damage public services, labour markets and communities. The expert advisory group on migration and population estimates a net migration reduction of between 30 and 50 per cent by 2040, which would mean up to a 5 per cent decline in our working age population. Overall, we estimate immigration changes could result in a GDP reduction of around £5 billion. The UK government's immigration policies disregard sectors relied upon during the pandemic, including our valued social care workers. To date, the UK government has refused to engage with the Scottish government on these crucial issues, and I would urge them to see sense and do so urgently. Gail Ross. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer, um, deeply worrying as it is. I am getting reports locally of falling numbers of people working in hotels and other tourism businesses. Now, if we are going to ask people to holiday in Scotland again this summer, what can be done to ensure our tourism sector has enough staff to cope, given that a high percentage of them came from continental Europe? Minister. Deciding Officer Gail Ross raises a really important point. I, I don't want to prejudge where we will be come the summer, but I know where we were last year, and many of us chose, of course, to holiday at home in Scotland. Of course, that will only be possible with a sustainable tourism industry, so we will work hard to support communities like Caithness, Sutherland and Ross to ensure that infrastructure is there for visitors when the sector is deemed safe to reopen again. The Scottish Government has provided unprecedented support to businesses throughout the pandemic. But the end of freedom of movement in the middle of a global pandemic has created unnecessary uncertainty, which could have been avoided. Gaining further powers over our migration system would give the Scottish Government the ability to further mitigate these issues in the interests of the people of Scotland. Question two, Willie Coffey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it will develop its international relations in a post-Brexit era. Minister. The UK's decision to leave the EU has undoubtedly posed challenges to Scotland's ability to engage closely with international partners. Despite this, the Scottish Government stands firm in its outward-looking approach to international relations. We continue to work from Scotland and through our network of eight international offices to strengthen our international relationships, increase trade and investment, and our overarching objective of sustainable economic growth in Scotland. Willie Coffey. And I thank the Minister for that answer. It is important that we continue to develop our strong business, economic and cultural links post-Brexit and not allow Scotland's ambitions to be thwarted by the actions of others. Could the Minister provide any further details on how we can maintain and enhance these connections, for example, in terms of the digital single market, the Erasmus Exchange Programme, and also support for international artists in Europe and internationally? Minister. We will continue to build international links through our international network with partners such as SDI and Scottish Enterprise. Cultural and education exchange are also really important to Scotland's international role, as Willie Coffey touched upon. 
which is why we are continuing to explore options following the UK Government's decision to end our participation in the Erasmus programme. The Scottish Government is working with stakeholders and others to explore how we can further support and enable cross-border working and collaboration in our culture and creative sectors. We continue to call on the UK Government to seek extensive reciprocal mobility arrangements with the EU for the culture and creative sectors. Question 3, John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent representations it has made to the UK Government regarding trade deals with countries linked to genocide. Minister Graham Day, please. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government condemns human rights abuses wherever they occur. Our vision for trade, published last month, set clear principles that underpin how we trade, including promoting good governance, the rule of law, and human rights internationally. We have made clear to the UK Government that any future trade agreements must respect these principles. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that answer. I just would seek reassurance from him that in any contact the Scottish Government has either with the, through the UK or directly with other countries, for example, the performance of uh, China against the Uyghur minority and in Burma or Myanmar against the Rohingya, they have both been deplorable and, I think, decried worldwide. And I would just hope that he would uh, do anything he can uh, to support that. Minister. Uh, Presiding officer, the, um, it was extremely disappointing indeed that the UK government rejected an amendment to the trade bill, uh, which was inserted by the House of Lords, that would have allowed trade agreements to be revoked with the High Court judge, one of the signatories, to be a state that had committed genocide. Um, it was the, a missed opportunity to place a marker in legislation to establish that our trade relationship should reflect our national values and be based on ethical and principled decisions, not just financial ones. The Scottish Government will continue to raise human rights issues wherever and whenever that is appropriate. Question 4, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding long-term replacements for EU funding streams. Cabinet Se Secretary Michael Russell, please. Uh, presiding officer, the UK government have failed to engage with us in a meaningful way across a number of EU programmes, including fisheries, structural funds, and competitive programmes such as Erasmus+. We've been clear and consistent in our position that we expect full replacement of EU funds to ensure no detriments to Scotland's finances. We expect the UK government to fully respect the devolution settlement in any such future arrangements. Scotland's uncertain outlook on replacement of EU programme funding continues, and it's only exacerbated by provisions in the Internal Market Act and the decision to reduce the spending review to a single year. Alan Smith. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? One of the most important EU funding streams for Scotland's rural and coastal communities has been the LEADER programme. You know, the current programme is ending, and, and sadly there are no proposals for long-term support for the types of, of innovative community projects LEADER has supported in the past few decades. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, does the Scottish Government support a long-term replacement for LEADER in Scotland, and how does it believe this could be achieved now that the, the, those EU funding streams will be coming to an end? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the member is right to be concerned about LEADER, which, although it has had its critics, has been very influential, as he knows and I know, in rural Scotland. It is vital that there are such programmes, and they are simply not being brought forward in any detail or indeed uh, at all by the UK government. There is a, a, a present consultation on, um, on funding, but it is, uh, it is not clear what will happen as a result of it. There is also considerable misleading information being put out. The UK government said yesterday, uh, in response to a remark I made about the Erasmus scheme, that they had worked very closely with devolved administrations to prepare an alternative programme in the event the UK chose not to participate in Erasmus. That is simply not true. Uh, the reality of the situation is not only have the UK government deployed their replacement, the Turing scheme, via the Internal Markets Act, which removes all devolved competency and all involvement in the replacement scheme's design or implementation. They have also, and this should worry the member about leader, set a budget that is far lower than the uh, reality that is presently being experienced by Erasmus, and in addition have refused to release their assessment of why they will not take part in Erasmus. I think this all bodes very ill for those my, in my constituency and those represented by Mr. Smith and others who are reliant on the leader scheme. They do not have any friends in these matters in the UK government. 
and a supplementary from John Mason. Thank you. It has been suggested that the DWP will be involved in the distribution of some of these funds to replace the EU structural funds, which seems a little bit surprising given their lack of expertise in this area. Does the Cabinet Secretary have any thoughts on this issue? Cabinet Secretary. It's not only surprising, but wrong. The reality is that there should be, uh, for example, in the Shared Prosperity Fund, the involvement of the Scottish Government, which has been involved in the distribution of social funding money. We put forward proposals on that. But the UK government are ideologically hidebound on this. They dislike devolution, they dislike dis dealing with the devolved administrations, and they want to pretend that all this money comes from them. But we don't even know what that money will look like, let alone how much it will be. And question five, Jamie Green, please. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it plans to publish the draft bill for an independence referendum announced, announced in its programme for government for 2020-2021. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, presiding officers, we set out in the programme for government, we will publish a draft bill for an independence referendum before the end of this parliament. That's still our intention. I will update the parliament on this in due course. There are, I believe, five weeks still to go. Amy Green. And given that the Scottish Parliament will dissolve, likely in five weeks' time, and in light of the ongoing COVID pandemic, uh, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary a simple question? Uh, I've made it multiple choice, if it's helpful. Uh, in the limited time available to us as a parliament, should we debate A, a draft bill on independence, B, Scotland's drug death crisis, or C, the overdue OECD report into Scottish education, which yesterday the parliament voted for the immediate release of? Cabinet Secretary. Well, presiding officer, I think the parliament should debate the future of Scotland and how we make Scotland a better country. Uh, Scotland will become a better country if it is free to make its own decisions. It can only become a worse country if it follows the uh, UK government out into the uh, dangerous cul-de-sac of Brexit. I would have thought Jamie Green would have realised that and wanted to argue in the interests of his constituents. Clearly he does not. He wishes only to argue in the interests of the UK government. The A, B or C? Sorry, I missed that. Uh, no, no, you, but you had your answer there. No, there's no second go at it, afraid. Question seven, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the financial and personnel resource required to conduct a second independence referendum. The Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, on the 18th of March 2020, I wrote to the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster to confirm that the Scottish Government has paused work to prepare for an independence referendum in order to focus on response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Aside from the publication of a draft bill for an independence referendum for introduction during the next parliamentary term, which will require a minimal amount of civil service resources and time, that continues to be the Scottish Government's position, and all other work is currently paused. We're very clear that the independence referendum should only take place once the COVID-19 pandemic is over. If there's a majority support for an independence referendum in the next parliamentary term, we'll return to the issue when it's appropriate to do so. Brian Whittle. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. If I can help the Cabinet Secretary out here, the total cost of the independence referendum in 2014 was in excess of £16 million. Yet the Cabinet Secretary for Finances it pains to stress the financial pressures that the Scottish Government is under as a response to the pandemic, with the First Minister making it clear that we have uh, got a long way to go before the pandemic is behind us. Given those facts, does the Cabinet Secretary seriously expect Scots to agree that a rerun of a once-in-a-generation referendum before the end of the year is a better and more urgent use of public funds in restoring and rebuilding the economy and our public services. As I make clear, my answer, and clearly Mr Whittle was not listening, so I repeat it, we, an independence referendum should only take place once the COVID-19 pandemic is over. But I would ask Mr Whittle to reflect for just a moment. I mean, self-reflection is clearly not a talent he has, but let him reflect on this. <laughs> the, cost, the cost of Brexit is hundreds of billions of pounds. And to be lectured by a Conservative on the cost of democracy is, is something that even I find hard to swallow. James Dornan, supplementary. Thank you, President Officer. Cabinet Secretary, it has been reported that Downing Street is looking to hire up to 50 taxpayer-funded advisors for its anti-independence campaign unit. Now, that is quite an allocation of financial and personal resources, I would suggest. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this looks like a panicked attempt by the UK Government to gear up for a referendum and suggest that the Tories may finally be coming to the realisation that standing in the way of democracy is unsustainable? Cabinet Secretary. 
It does make me reflect upon the two questions we've just had, uh, which appear to be desperate attempts to deflect attention from those sort of facts. There are also attempts to deflect attention, for example, from the fact that uh, last night, a non-elector, somebody who has never been elected, as far as I know, even to the membership of a bowling club or the presidency of a bowling club, uh, David Frost, uh, who is now a peer, becomes a minister in the cabinet. Now, this is utterly undemocratic. So I would suggest to Mr. Whittle and, and, and Mr. Green, go and consider what democracy is, then come back and ask a question. But until they do, they're not in a position to either ask a question or get an answer other than that. Question six, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it can take to prevent legislation in devolved areas being passed that is contrary to a resolution on a legislative consent motion by the Scottish Parliament. Cabinet Secretary. Well, presiding officer, the only answer to this question is to say that Scotland must become independent, because an independent parliament would not be subject to those restrictions. We will, of course, always try to explore every option in devolution. But in practice, devolution uh, is based upon the doctrine of the unlimited sovereignty of Westminster, which means that it claims the right to legislate on whatever it wants, including devolved areas, and including if it wishes, the abolition of this parliament. The Supreme Court has confirmed statutory protection of the civil convention included in the Scotland Act 2016 is toothless, undermining a key recommendation of the Smith Commission, providing in the end no protection from a Westminster government that is determined to flout constitutional norms, as the current UK government is. Recent events uh, from the EU Withdrawal Act to the outrage of the UK Internal Market Act have demonstrated that the UK government is not only able, but willing to ignore the views of this parliament, and constrain and reduce our power unilaterally and without consent. The only answer to that is independence. Patrick Hardy. Since the beginning of devolution, the courts have had the ability to strike down legislation from the Scottish Parliament if it strays beyond legislative competence. And I suspect voters endorsing that devolution settlement would never have imagined there would be a UK government so willing to routinely pass major legislation uh, in devolved areas. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that legislation passed by the UK Parliament in this way against consent decisions of the Scottish Parliament is fundamentally illegitimate? Uh, and does he agree that anyone seeking to suggest that a solution can exist other than independence must, as a minimum, agree that courts should have the power to strike down legislation of the UK Parliament that is passed in devolved areas without the consent of the devolved legislature. I not only agree with the member, I have to say that I find the contention he's making utterly unremarkable. I think anybody who believes in democracy would regard that to be true. It is therefore extraordinary that there is a body of people elected to the Scottish Parliament who do not accept that principle. I just find that, find that astonishing. Well, thank you. That concludes questions on Constitution, Europe and External Affairs. We're a little ahead of time. But it's a follow-on business, and I now hand over to my colleague for the next item of business.